Hi, I'm Cheryl Dorchensky, Executive Director of Americans United with Israel, and founder of Atlanta Israel Coalition. We are thrilled to welcome you here today for the tour of the Golan Heights. This is a mix of a live and virtual tour run by our fabulous Davis Fussman. We have to thank our sponsors because without them and those of you who have donated, we couldn't make this happen. The Jewish Federation of Greater Atlanta, um, Consulate General of Israel to Southeast, the Evans Family Foundation, and Harut, North America, Harut, um, World Harut. Thank you all for contributing so we can make this possible and keep it free for the public. We want to thank our promotional partners that are all listed here. Feel free to check our Facebook page and our um, different social medias. If you have any questions, reach out to us. Thank you to our media partners. And um, we uh, are excited to be bringing you this tour by David Sussman. David, are you here with us? I am here with you and I'm very excited to be here with you. Should I get started? Please. All right, let me just hand the camera over to my camera guy, Eliyahu. Can you guys all see me? We can see you. And let me just let everyone know, if you have questions for David, please type them in the Q&A. He will be happy to answer them. This tour is going to be a little bit different than our last few tours because the Golan spread out. David's going to tell you quite a bit about it now. Right. Well, first of all, before I even get started, let me just say how excited I am for this opportunity and to give my debt of gratitude to the Atlanta Israel Coalition, to Cheryl and Lee, and to everybody in the back office for all the effort that they put into bringing you all this great content about Israel. For those of you who are just joining us for the first time, this is part of a, a, a five-part series. This is the last of the five live virtual tours that we've been doing across Israel. And if you've missed any of them, please send an email to the Atlanta Israel Coalition. Our email address is at the top of the chat or contact them on Facebook. And of course, if you've already registered for this tour and you're watching it on your computer, so they're gonna send out an email to you with a recording of this tour. Uh, but in addition, you can write back to them and request any or all of the previous tours. Uh, today's tour is on the Golan Heights, which you can see behind me. It's an absolutely beautiful, stunning, and really hot day here in the Golan. It just started to have a cool breeze coming in from the north. The, the cool winds always come from the north. That's to my right, which I'm guessing is screen left for you. And, uh, and that's because this is the end of the day. It's five o'clock in the evening here in Israel. And we have about two and a half hours left of sunlight. And as the sun begins to set, the cool winds begin to come in. And it's a little bit of a reprieve from all that hot weather we've been having lately. The Golan Heights today, our tour, because of its vastness, and it's really not that vast, but it is quite vast for a virtual tour, for a live tour. It's uh, roughly about 50 miles long and about 20 miles wide at its widest point. So it's relatively small, but if we were to travel all of that here in the Golan with the windy roads, it would take the entire tour just to go from north to the south. So I'm focusing a little bit here in the northern region um, some of the military installations that are still here in ruins from the Syrians prior to 1967. We're going to visit a couple of those sites. Uh, I'm probably going to stop off at like a, a little roadside attraction. And uh, I'm hoping that there's going to be one of Israel's minorities, a representative from the Druze community, D-R-U-Z-E, that will be able to talk a little bit about the Druze people. And then we're gonna continue south and head to the southern region of the Golan Heights, which I think the highlight of the tour will be meeting Major Yaakov Sullivan, who serves in the 188th Tank Brigade, a very, very famous unit here in Israel, a unit which served here in the Golan Heights during the Yom Kippur War of 1973. And Major Sullivan served in Gaza during a few campaigns, including the most recent escalation that took place just a little bit less than a month ago. And he's going to tell us a little bit about the Yom Kippur War, about Tel Saki, the uh, site of one of the famous battles that took place there, and, uh, and also to talk a little bit about the geopolitics in this region. We have to realize that the Golan Heights sits right in between, literally 
from the hilltop that you can just see over to my right, which is Mount Bental. And anybody who's visited Israel on like a 10 day trip has probably been to Mount Bental. It's the uh, main tourist uh, hill here in the Golan Heights, which looks out onto Syria, which is just a little bit that way. I would probably say it's about a half a mile behind me. And we're actually gonna travel just several hundred feet from the border of Syria. And so we'll be able to look right inside uh, into uh, Syrian territory. About Mount Bental is a bunker that was built by the Israelis and it's no longer used today. Of course, it could be turned operational relatively quickly, but it's open to tourists that can run through the bunkers and you know um, learn a little bit about the various wars over here. And, uh, and further north, you know, the boundaries of, uh, you don't need to grab that, the boundaries of uh, Israel, so sorry, the boundaries of the Golan Heights, 50 miles long, 20 miles wide, the four boundaries of the Golan Heights all the way to the north. You probably can't make it out too good on the screen right now because it's a little bit hazy today, but that is Mount Hermon. And Mount Hermon is the largest mountain here in Israel. It's roughly about 10,000 feet high, very, very tall mountain. In fact, even now, and as hot as it is, the end of June, at the very, very peak, I can still spot a couple of places where there's still snow on the top of the mountain. And in the winter time, and especially this winter, we had a tremendous snowstorm really across Israel from the north all the way down to the center in Jerusalem and where I live in Gush Etzion, which is in between Jerusalem and Hebron. We had about 10 inches of snow. On the Golan Heights, they had multiple feet of snow and it opened up the ski resort. That's right, there's a ski resort on the top of Mount Hermon. And a little bit later on during the tour, when we have that long drive towards the south, I'm gonna queue up a video that I recorded previously of the ski resort. I always joke around with my clients who come for a visit here to Israel that I have the pleasure of guiding that while we're in the Golan, that if they wanted to in the wintertime, we can go skiing on the Hermon. And on the same day, if we go early enough, take the five and a half hour drive all the way south to a lot and go scuba diving in beautiful tropical waters in the Red Sea where you have gorgeous coral reef and tropical fish and dolphins and sea turtles and all the great things that you can imagine when you're scuba diving that you'd want to see. So that's the northern border over there, Mount Hermon. Only about 7% of it is actually in Israeli territory. The other 93%, which stretches off to the east, is in Syrian territory. And the very peak of Mount Hermon, the highest point, is actually controlled by the Syrians. So we're at a little bit of a lower elevation than them. And of course, the higher up you are, the easier it is to defend yourself, the more, bigger advantage that you have, militarily speaking. So they actually have the advantage on the Hermon. But from the top of the Hermon, we actually get to look down onto Damascus, the capital of Syria, where I'm standing right now next to Mount Bental, just several hundred feet away from the Syrian border. We are only roughly 35 miles from Damascus, just to give you an idea of where we're sitting here in the Middle East. You know, when we think of Israel, it's such a Western country. It's such an advanced country. It's a beautiful country. that sometimes we forget how close we are to these other capitals of these other nations here in Israel. We're closer to Damascus than we are to Tiberias, which sits on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, the Canary. We're closer to Beirut right now than we are to Jerusalem. We're only 480 miles from Baghdad in Iraq, right? So if we're traveling by car and there was a nice highway, what is that, a six, seven hour drive to get to Baghdad? Many of us have traveled in our cars longer than that to go on vacation. That's where we are right now. We have the Hermon to the north and just slightly to the west, you would have Lebanon. And, and between us and Lebanon, you have the Hula Valley, which is the border of the Golan to the east. To the east, you have the Hula Valley and the Sea of Galilee. And to the west, where you have Syria now, just literally behind me, you have the Rakad Riverbed. And then to the south, the Yarmouk River, which flows into the Jordan River. And I'm going to talk about these various rivers that flow into the Jordan River, because 
in our early days here in Israel, the Sea of Galilee, the Kinneret, the largest body of fresh water here in Israel, supplied over half of our fresh water. So it was our lifeline. If you don't have water, you're not going to live very long. And that was not lost on the Syrians. And we're going to talk a little bit about what they did to try and try up the Kinneret on us back in the 60s. So that's the borders over here of the Golan Heights. Mount Bental over there. Behind me in this direction, I don't think you're going to be able to make it out so well, but this is called Mount Avital. And this is an intelligence gathering base. Much of this mountain, which is volcanic, is hollowed out inside that has sensitive military uh, technology in it that is listening if they want you know, to tap people's cell phones or whatever it is that they want to listen to in Syria in order to uh, scout out the terrain and to learn about what's going on there. Obviously, intelligence gathered. Mount Avital over there, Mount Bental over here, the Hermon a little bit to the north. And with the exception of the Hermon, which is a real mountain, the rest of these mountains, which are really hills, but we call them mountains here in Israel, these are all extinct volcanoes, okay? I'm just going to bend down here real quick and just show you a couple of these rocks down here. This is all volcanic rock. This plateau of the Golan Heights that we're in right now is all volcanic rock. You know, the topography of Israel is amazing. It changes so dramatically within just an hour drive from anywhere. We have so many different topographical regions here with different type of uh, vegetation and animals and of course, soil as well. The Golan Heights was formed roughly about 80 to 100 million years ago when there was a lot of tectonic movements and it opened up the, the, the magma underneath the earth and it came out in these volcanoes and formed the topography of the Golan Heights and the volcanic rock. So what I wanna do right now is I wanna jump into my car and we're gonna drive just for about maybe five minutes. And I'm gonna take you to a very, very unique, special place that most of you, even if you've been in Israel, you probably haven't been here. It's somewhat off limits, but I have a little, what we call here, protexia. I know the right people you could say. And, uh, and I'm gonna take you into the old Syrian military headquarters here in the Golan Heights, which was of course destroyed in 1967 during the Six Day War. And when we are in that old base, I am going to talk a little bit about the Six Day War, what started it, how it was fought, the miraculous victory of Israel in eight days that we were able to defeat an army that was so much uh, more powerful and bigger than our own. We were way outnumbered. We were fighting against the Egyptians who had a very, very large army, the Jordanians, the Syrians, even the Iraqis had sent forces into Jordan to help the Jordanian military. And Saudi Arabia also committed, although they never fulfilled that commitment, to send forces during the fighting as well. But they did commit and, uh, and we're going to enact an embargo on anybody who assisted Israel. And of course, everybody already at that time was still uh, was, was drinking down that oil that Saudi Arabia has been providing to the world for quite some time uh, right now. And as we're driving, I'm just gonna roll down the window. Eliyahu, will you just like let the folks back at home see everything out the window over here between these trees and these trees were planted to protect the road because we're so close to the border and these trees were you know planted so that the syrians wouldn't be able to take any uh um sniper fire on on the people traveling here on the road but what you're looking at and i'm actually going to pull off real quick here are vineyards beautiful vineyards israel has some of the best wine in uh in the world, really. We're winning awards all the time for our wine. You don't need to hold on to that. Hold on one second, folks, sorry. There we go. Let me just fix this here. We're just having a little technical difficulty. There you go. There you go. Look at those beautiful vineyards there, my friends. That's part. That beautiful uh, 
vineyards of the Golan Heights. And the vineyards here are such great quality because of this volcanic rock in this region. All of those minerals that were at, you know, down deep inside the earth are, um, have been brought up. And that's what's making the soil over here is all that volcanic rock, which obviously is packed with nutrients and allows these vines to, to grow so well. Some of my favorite wines here in Israel actually come from the Golan Heights. You know, Israel, in addition to the Golan Heights and the, and, and the volcanic rock, you know, we have a lot of great wines that come out of Hari Yehuda, the Judean mountains. And the, uh, the Judean mountains is all limestone. We have wine from the coastal plains from the area around Tel Aviv. And, uh, and of course, in the desert as well. All of the different types of soil content. Hold on one second. I'm looking for a turnoff over here because I want to show you some of these buildings. Show them out the window over here. These are old Syrian bunkers that you can see on the side of the road over here. These were military barracks that housed the Syrian army. I'm going to pull in right here, I think. Yep, perfect spot to do so. These were old Syrian uh, bunkers over here. Not bunkers, barracks that housed the Syrian military. Keep that window down. You guys can see all of that right there. Really, really amazing here. So much uh, history. Now, after the Six Day War and the Golan Heights was liberated, some of these old bunkers were used by Israelis who came to settle the Golan. The very first kibbutz, the very first shared you know, living community. Um, called Meron Golan, which now has a very, very beautiful grounds, beautiful homes and a tourist center as well for ATVing and horseback riding and a nice hotel. They actually lived in these old barracks. They actually turned these barracks into their homes and started to plant some of these vineyards that we just saw. So uh, really amazing that uh, Mesiris Nefesh, we call it in, in uh, Hebrew, that they just were so committed to the cause that they really were putting their lives on the line by moving out here to the Golan uh, after the Six Day War. But today the Golan Heights has a population of roughly 50,000 people, but only half of them are Jewish. The other half are those Druze people I mentioned briefly earlier, um, who used to be Syrian citizens prior to 1967. And they're very, very thankful that they fell on to the Israeli side after the fighting, because here they have absolutely equal rights. They're allowed to vote. Many of them serve in the military. And, uh, and uh, in Syria, they are always treated as second-class citizens. Because the Druze people, it's an, a religion that's an offshoot of Islam that developed roughly about the 11th, 12th century CE of the Common Era. And, uh, and so they believe in a new prophet. And in Islam, it says that there'll be no prophet after Muhammad. So it was a total breakaway, even though they hold a lot of the same tenets, it was a total breakaway from Islam. And so they were persecuted heavily and continue to be persecuted in many Islamic lands and nations. Of course, they can't admit that they're happy to be part of Israel openly because they're also terrified that, you know, uh, God forbid the Golan Heights is ever taken over by the Syrians. The Syrians will slaughter them if they know that they supported Israel. So here we are, literally hundreds of feet from the Syrian border. There's another family over here as well. Very unique, you don't, you don't see that very often. But we're in the main building of the Syrian military here on the Golan Heights. This building was built by the Russians for the Syrian army. Right? the major uh, benefactor of the Arab armies, whether it's Egypt, Syria, Iran, oftentimes are the Russians. 
And the Russians provided state-of-the-art military equipment to the Syrians who used them during the Six-Day War as well as the Yom Kippur War. It's really miraculous that we're able to be victorious. But I just want you to look down the hallway over here. You can see a lot of beautiful graffiti that's been done here in the, uh, in the halls. And the Six-Day War, let's just talk a little bit about the Six-Day War, which uh, begins in 1967, in the beginning of June, June 4th, 1967. But it really starts about well, years before that. It's really just a continuation of the War of Independence of 1948. Let's talk about the president of Egypt at that time, a man by the name of Nasser. And Nasser began to lose his grip, his power in Egypt, but also his influence on the Arab world. And any time, including today, that a political leader here in the Middle East wants to rise up and you know, uh, increase his fame and his likeliness amongst the Arab people, he will always focus his attention on Israel. In modern times, you know, never mind Iran, what nation can we think about that sort of rose up in the last 10, 15 years? And one of the, one of the statements that they always give is that they want to annihilate Israel, that Israel you know, is an occupying force, and that's Turkey. Right, Turkey has been speaking negatively about Israel for a long time now. And claims to support the Palestinian people, but really what he's looking to do is solidify his power here in the Middle East. So Nasser is the same thing. He wants to increase his power, so he focuses attention on Israel, and he tells the UN, right? The UN had these uh, peacekeeping troops in the Sinai Peninsula, since the 1956 war that took place there, Israel even occupied the Sinai Peninsula for, for a little while until you know, we had to evacuate under orders of the international community. Guys, look at the stair. We just went up this old stairwell over here. You can see this is where a rocket actually entered into the building, all the reinforced concrete. So we can't go up any higher on this staircase. We're going to go up a different staircase to get to the roof. But let me just continue with Nasser real quick. Nasser throws out the UN forces. At least that's what he was telling them to do. He didn't really want them to be thrown out. He just wanted to, you know, flex his muscles and let everybody hear that he wanted to destroy Israel. But I can't because of the UN. So he says to the UN, get out of here, get out of the Sinai. And much to his shock and dismay, guess what? They actually left. The UN packed up and completely left the Sinai Peninsula, which sort of left Nasser twilling his thumb saying, what do I do now? Well, now he had to follow through with his words. And he amassed his forces on the Sinai Peninsula along the border of Israel. And then he commits the first act of war. He cuts off the Straits of Tehran. This is where the Red Sea sort of goes out into the Indian Ocean. It's the major trade route uh, to the Far East from Israel. It's also where all the oil comes in. It comes into the Gulf of Aqaba, to the port of Eilat. And so he closed off the Straits of Tehran. That is an act of war under international law. You're not allowed to mess with another nation's trade line, trade routes in international water. You can't mess with another nation's water as well. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about what they did to dry up the Canara, the Sea of Galilee. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. So Nasser commits the first act of war, cuts off the Straits of Tehran. He masses his troops along the Israeli border. The Syrians are doing the same right here on the Golan Heights. And they're telling the Jordanians that they better mass their troops on the Eastern banks of the Jordan River, ready to enter Israel as well, come, let's continue down this hallway. And so Israel now is facing a, a major uphill battle. I mean, this is, we're talking, you know, the, uh, uh, between the Syrians, between the Jordanians and the Egyptians, they have 750, 800,000 troops, right? They have hundreds of thousands of uh, armaments and tanks and a, a much bigger air force than what, what you know, the small nation of Israel has. And Israel starts to prepare for war. How do we prepare for war? Well, one of the things we began to do is to be, dig mass graves. 
in Jerusalem in the National Stadium, they actually had room for 40,000 graves, 40,000 graves. They said, even if we win this war, the casualty count is going to be something unimaginable, unimaginable. Look at this building, this whole side of this building was just taken out and you get this beautiful view of the reservoir. This reservoir, the water that you can see over there, that is in Israeli territory. So I'm not too sure if you can make it out. A little bit to the left, there's some white buildings over there and, uh, and there's a fence. And we are literally probably about two, no more than 300 feet from the Syrian border right now. You can see the old city of Kunetra. That used to be the capital of the Golan for the Syrians. Uh, today, it's completely abandoned. They built a new city of Kunetra with the help of the Russians, which has a population of roughly about 100,000. Remember, the Golan Heights has a population of roughly 50,000, only half of which are Jewish. So much, much bigger. Uh, wow, this is amazing. Really amazing. So we're preparing for this war. And something amazing, Israel decides that they're going to do a preemptive strike. War is imminent. The Egyptians have already enacted an act of war by cutting off the Straits of Tehran. We have complete, I don't know if I want to say authority, but legality to strike. This was an act of war. And so we went in and a surprise attack in the morning of June 4th and completely obliterated the Egyptian Air Force, all of their runways we had blown up, almost all of their planes we had blown up. And we did the same to the Jordanians and the Syrians, which gave us aerial supremacy. And that's very, very important and played a key role in our victory. Come on over here. I just want to take it to the edge of this building over here because it's just so beautiful and really so incredible to be so close to the Syrian border. You know, in 2013, 2014, 2015, when the Syrian civil war, which has claimed you know, over a million lives already, was in full rage, the Russians, their MiG planes were bombing installations of the rebel forces here as well. You could actually see Russian MiGs flying on the horizon from this location. And you would see ISIS and Al-Qaeda. You could see some of their flags actually over in Kunetra. You could see it with the naked eye. Um, they were right here massed on our border, these ISIS and Al-Qaeda on our border. But really, they weren't a threat to us. They were fighting against the Syrian regime. And so they found safety here because of the ceasefire agreement that we have with Syria that is signed every six months to continue. They are not allowed to amass troops within two kilometers of the border. So Al-Qaeda and ISIS actually found safety along the border with Israel. But not only that when the civilians, right, the people who were dragged into this conflict over there, when they were injured, the Syrians did nothing for them. ISIS and Al-Qaeda did nothing for them. Who were the only ones providing this humanitarian aid was Israel. And so they were able to get to the border. We actually took them into Israel and we took care of them in our main hospital in Spot, uh, Ziv Hospital. But we also built many, many... Um, uh, you know, um, field hospitals here in the Golan Heights. And we took care of them, women who were pregnant, kids who needed a root canal, needed dentist work, they were in pain, a leg that needed to be amputated, they were shot, they would come here, and we took them in and we took care of them. And this was really, you know, served many, many uh, different purposes. And one of them is we wanted to make sure that the civilians on the other side of the border realized that we're not the devil, that we're not evil. We wanted to help them out. We wanted to let them know that we can be friends. And the other one was also a lot of them became spies. Once they realized that we weren't so evil, um, they wanted to help us. They realized that we weren't hurting them. It was their own government which was hurting them. So th that was the two main reasons why. But we're going to talk a little bit about that more with, uh, with uh, Major Sullivan. So I don't know if you can see it. Let me take the camera real quick. Let me see what you guys are looking at over there. Taking it right to the corner of the building. You can see the corner right there. You got the reservoir right there. That is in Israel. And just right there, you can see those white buildings. That's a UN uh, uh, peacekeeping force uh, monitoring, to, monitoring the border. And that's the border. It's literally on the other side of this you know, lake. It's really a reservoir. But the border, I can see the fence right there. It's like a little gray line. That is the border. And this big, large building you can see right there. 
that is uh, on the Syrian side. And that's another military headquarters for the Syrians in 1967 has been ruined. And all of that over there is completely abandoned today. But I want you to take a look at these trees right here. And as you're looking at those trees, uh, we are going to uh, make our way out of, uh, out of this building. And I wanna talk about one of the unsung heroes, or at least he's not sung loud enough. One of the greatest spies to ever live, not just here in Israel, but anywhere in the world. He puts James Bond to shame. In fact, they made a whole docu-series about him on Netflix called The Spy, and I'm talking about Ellie Cohen. This guy was just absolutely incredible. Brilliant, brilliant man. Was born and raised in Egypt, but with a, a, a strong Jewish identity. His family uh, practicing Jews and Zionistic as well. In 1948, when Israel declared its independence, they decided to pack up all their kids and move here to Israel with the exception of Eli Cohen, who was in the middle of university. I think he was studying mechanical engineering. And uh, so he stayed back and uh, in Egypt, but already by 1956, the anti-Semitism there grew so, so large and it was so impactful that most of the Jews were forced to leave Egypt. You know, a lot of people don't understand that at the end of that tumultuous period here in the Middle East and around Israel between 1945 and 1955, there were more Jewish refugees than there were Arab refugees, right? Nobody talks about the Jewish refugees, because everybody focuses on the Palestinian refugees, because well, the Jews here welcomed their brothers and sisters with open arms and educated them and housed them and built a beautiful nation for ourselves. But there was more Jewish refugees than there were Arab refugees at the end of that period. And Eli Cohen being one of them, and he comes here to Israel and he's looking for work, and he ends up getting recruited by the Mossad. Right? He's an intelligent man. He speaks many different languages. He speaks French, English, obviously Hebrew and Arabic, but not just Arabic. He speaks Arabic with a mother tongue because he grew up in Egypt, just like I speak English with a mother tongue. But I live here in Israel because I grew up in America. And uh, he's recruited by the Mossad. And they teach him to speak Arabic with a Syrian dialect. And for his first mission, he actually... Okay, okay, okay. So the, his, uh, he, his, uh, he, in, he's sent to uh, South America and he infiltrates the Syrian expat community that's living there. And just to find out what the political talk is. And uh, he joins a political party over there called the Ba'ath Party. The Ba'ath Party is the same party that Saddam Hussein was a part of. And sure enough, by the late 1950s, or maybe it was already the 1961, the Ba'ath Party had a military coup and took over um, Syria. And so now the Ba'ath Party, who Ali Cohen is now a part of, is the leading power in Syria. And he's now charged with the duty of going to Damascus. Can you imagine this? Eli Cohen, he's a Jewish priest for crying out loud. He goes with a priestly family from the Kohanim. And he's now going to Damascus. And he sets up shop over there as like a wealthy businessman. And he has these extravagant parties. And he's inviting all these generals, even the president of Syria himself. And they're doing all these like crazy wild things that are totally not permissible in Islam. But we're not going to tell anybody. And all this crazy stuff over there. And he becomes friends with him. He's gifted. He's got great speech. He's got photographic memory. And because he becomes friends with all these generals and with the president, he has access to all the military bases here on the Golan Heights. But not only does he have access and with his photographic memory, he's able to send all this information back to Israel, but he's also giving them advice. And what is one of the advices that he gives them? He says, wherever you have buildings, now this is a very large building, this is the headquarters, but wherever you have the barracks, like the one that we just saw, which the kibbutz of Meron Golan actually uses some of their homes uh, in the beginning years, he said, plant eucalyptus trees. Those are the trees that you can see just behind me. And as we're driving through the Golan Heights, we'll see more of those trees. Come on in. He says, plant these eucalyptus trees. And why plant eucalyptus trees? Is I want you to plant these eucalyptus trees in order to provide shade, in order to provide shade for the soldiers. Right? That they can have some recreation, build the barracks near springs, live water. We can build swimming 
pools, place for them to refresh, and the trees will grow and it'll give them shade. And not only that, but it'll also hide some of the bunkers and some of the military, uh, the caches of weaponry. And so in 1967, when the Air Force came up here to the Golan Heights, it was almost like they had a bullseye in all the strategically important positions here in the Golan Heights because they just had to look for the eucalyptus trees that you could just see right out my window right now. Wherever there was eucalyptus trees, you knew that there was some type of military installation from the Syrians. Now, unfortunately, Ellie Cohen did not live to see the victory here in the Golan Heights. The Syrians realized that there had to be a mole within the government. And why? So remember, I talked about water issues. I talked about the Kinneret being the largest source of fresh water here in Israel in the early days. Today, it's desalinated water. And we really use very, very little water from the Sea of Galilee, with the exception of sending 50 million liters of water to Jordan as part of the peace treaty we have with Jordan. We give them 50 million liters of water, and that comes from the Canary. Right now, there's talks of building a desalination plant for Jordan so that we no longer need to take the water from the Canary, and the Canary can return to its normal level, and that we can open up the dam, which allows the water to continue to flow into the Jordan River, and that the Jordan River will return to its glory back in the heyday when the Israelites first entered the land of Israel and they crossed the Jordan River. Today, when you go down to the Dead Sea, where the Jordan enters the Dead Sea, it's just a small little trickle of water. And that's one of the reasons why the Dead Sea is evaporating and disappearing right before our eyes. We lose about a meter of water, uh, I don't know, depth of water in the uh, Dead Sea every single year. And that's because it's not being replenished by the Jordan River. So we build a desalination plant for Jordan. We don't have to siphon off the Canaret anymore. The Canaret rises up. We open up the dam. The water flows back into the Dead Sea. And, uh, and hopefully everybody is happy. So where does the water come from for the Jordan River and for the Canaret? Most of it comes from the Golan Heights. Most of it comes from the snow on the Hermon, on the mountain, which there's still a little bit of snow on the top of it. A few little patches I saw today. And it flows through the different ravines, making the Golan Heights a beautiful place to go hiking. There's lots of waterfalls and swimming holes here and, uh, and place for, for recreation. And it flows into various rivers like the Banyas, uh, the Don River, and all of this flows into the Jordan River, the northern part of the Jordan River, which flows into the Canary. Then you have the Sea of Galilee, and it's called the Sea because it has an entry point and an exit point. And it flows out the southern side of the Canaret, continuing along the Jordan River. So Syria realized that all their water that Israel was using was actually coming from the snowmelt from Syrian territory from the Golan Heights. And they began to build a canal that crossed the Golan Heights to divert the water away from Israel, away from the Jordan River, away from the Sea of Galilee, and towards Jordan. And if they were successful in doing that, the Canaret would have dried up after just a few years, really. And, uh, and we wouldn't have had any water. We would have had major, major water issues in those early days. Who knows if we would have been able to survive. And so Ellie Cohen heard all of these plans and he warned Israel. And he told them where they were amassing all of the uh, machinery to dig out these canals. And before the Syrians even started in certain sections, Israel came in and bombed the equipment. And that's when Syria said there has to be a mole. We didn't even start the construction of these canals and they're already bombing the equipment. And, uh, and one day they, um, they just came in and, uh, and they turned off in Damascus all of the frequencies, all of the... the messages that were being sent out from their various military installations. And the only frequency that was being sent out was coming from Ellie Cohen's apartment. They went in there, they found him red-handed sending messages back to Israel. He was arrested, he was tried. He was obviously guilty, but he was tried without any, any lawyer. And, uh, and he was hung in public in Damascus. And literally 10,000 people came to watch him die 
And then they hogtied his ankles and they dragged him through the streets of Damascus. They wouldn't give his bones up. They wouldn't give, even though the international community cried out to please return the body of the soldier to Israel, they refused. They buried him in a location and they were afraid that Israel was going to find it. And so they reburied him somewhere else and reburied him somewhere else. Now they claim that they don't know where he's buried, but there's been a lot of talk over the last couple of years that maybe the information is coming out and maybe the Russians are going to help. And who knows, hopefully his bones will be found that he can have a proper Jewish burial and, uh, and be returned to Eretz Kodesh here in Israel. I just stopped at this little roadside. Come, come on outside with me. We're just gonna take a very, very brief stop over here. I just want you to take a look. Uh, there's a little stand over here and a gentleman from the Druze community here in the Golan is selling fresh honey and uh, apples. The, the Druze people are very well known throughout Israel and in the Middle East for growing excellent, excellent apples. The only apples my family buy are from the Hermon and from the Druze community. I want to just take the camera. I want you guys just to take a look at some of the, uh, this is all locals here. We're going to buy some of this. And uh, the gentleman right here with like what looks like the white kippah, he's the Jews man. They wear a little white kippah if they're religious. Not everybody within the Jews community is religious, but you can also tell that in addition to the white uh, kippah, you can see he's wearing these special pants that are like baggy in the crotch area over there. And that's because within the Jews faith, when their Mashiach, when their Messiah comes, um, he's going to be born from a man. And they don't know who that man will be. And so they all wear these special pants. This is the truth. Um, to be ready and prepare for when Mashiach comes. Their religion is very, very secretive. In fact, even if you go online right now and look for uh, information on the Jews' faith, you're not going to find very much. And it's very secretive, but it's also not frowned upon if you're not religious. You choose to be religious or not. And if you do choose to be religious, um, the more you study, the more you know. There's sort of like levels, maybe like Freemasonry, right? But different, different levels. And the higher up you go, the more secrets you learn. I'm assuming it's somewhat similar in the Jews' faith, but unlike Freemasonry, which you can go online and learn all about, uh, the Druze people, you can't find any information about the Druze. The Druze people here in the Golan, we, we, we have about 120,000 Druze people living here in Israel. Most of them live near the Carmel Mountain, near Haifa, in the mountains near Haifa. About 100,000 of them live over there. The rest of them are over here in the Golan Heights. And uh, these two Druze people are a little bit different. The ones that live here in the Golan have family that live in Syria, right? And this is another vantage point. You can see all the white buildings you can see. I'm not too sure how, what you can see out there, but all the white buildings out there, that's all Syrian communities. And in 2013, 14, 15, fighting plumes of smoke, explosions, you'd see the Russian MiGs flying a tremendous amount of warfare. It was very, very scary to bring groups here to the Golan Heights and, um, and to see all of that. Um, so the Druze people, I mentioned earlier, were an offshoot of uh, Islam. There was a Fatimid, one of the dynasties that ruled here in the, in the Middle East was called the Fatimids. And they had a leader by the name of Al-Hakim. And Al-Hakim led, I guess, uh, 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 a, a war against all of the Christian sites here in the Middle East, and especially in Israel. And they um, destroyed the Church of the Sepulcher, which is the Holy of Holies for, for most Christians. Right? Most Christians believe this is the place that Jesus was crucified. And according to Christian theology, that he uh, was resurrected. And, uh, and they destroyed it. And that was really what precipitated the Crusades. The Crusades wanted to come to the Holy Land to rebuild the church and to you know, do away with this uh, Islamic rule over here that just destroyed all their churches that most of them dated back to the Byzantine period. Maybe about, most of them were about 700 years old. So um, after he destroyed all of these uh, churches, which Islam looks at Christianity as being a pagan religion, you know, they have a father, a son, a Holy Ghost, a Virgin Mary. So they look at it very much as being um, like Greek mythology, that God can, you know, have a child from a mortal woman, and uh, and they um, and so they said that he was the Messiah, right? He was the Messiah, the Islamic Messiah. But most people said, no, he's not the Messiah. He didn't fulfill all the requirements. And so some of his devout followers said, well, if he's not, if he's not, um, 
if he's not a the Messiah, then he's a prophet. Ding, 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 ding. And when these Muslims heard that he was a prophet, they started to persecute his followers, which became known as the Druze people. They were scattered across the Middle East, settling mostly on hilltops and in small valleys, trying to be hidden from you know, the naked eye, from other people who would attack and persecute them. And so the Druze people up here on the Golan that still have family, you know, in the Golan Heights, which, by the way, during the fighting of 2013, 2014, 2015, they wanted to, uh, they begged Israel to, they begged Israel to, um, to, to enter into Syria and to capture the Druze communities over there because ISIS and Al Qaeda, these fundamental Islamic groups were, murdering you know hundreds of these druze people in their community they, they were being slaughtered and uh it was a bit of a political issue up here that we were helping some of these injured isis and al-qaeda members that they came to the border we gave humanitarian aid to everybody again to convert them to realize that we're not the enemy and also to you know create spies for ourselves but the druze community here in the golan was very much infuriated by these actions of, uh, of Israel. I'm just taking a little detour over here and uh, I want to bring you to, um, I want to bring you to the border border and where there's a UN base. And then after that, we're gonna have to beeline it right to Telsaki because I have a feeling we're gonna be a little bit late for Major Sullivan, but uh, he'll wait for us. I just want you guys to see this because it's really, really incredible. And I'm gonna show you the de facto uh, border crossing, right? There is no official border crossing between us and Syria. We are two nations at war still with one another. It's just a ceasefire that we have. And, uh, but yet when any time humanitarian aid needs to be brought from Israel to Syria or somebody from Syria needs to be brought into uh, Israel, this is where they come through, all right? We're just gonna do a little U-turn. They really don't like people recording here, so I'm just gonna do this. Oof, scared that kind of a little dog right there. But that, here, look out the window. There. You guys can see all of that over there. There's a guard tower, the fence, that's the crossing. Sorry, I couldn't show it to you much longer, but they'll start coming for me. Hope you guys were able to see that a little bit. So, um, so just in short, the Druze people, as part of their ethos, I guess, is that wherever they live, they join the military, uh, whatever nation, whether it's in Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, in order to show that they are uh, loyal to the place that they're living. And uh, so much so that they will fight one another, even if their families, even if their family because they lived there. And in, during the first Lebanon war, which started in 1982, you had Druze members of the IDF who were fighting other Druze members who were part of the Lebanese army. And most of the Druze that live near or in the Carmel Mountains near Haifa serve in the military. In fact, you know, there are small people. There are only about 100,000 uh, Druze people that, that, that live here in Israel. 120 maybe, uh, but percentage wise, there's more Druze men that serve in the military than Jewish men, percentage wise, right? There's a larger percentage of Druze men, you know, per capita that serve in the army than Jewish, if you can imagine that. I served in the army. I was in an artillery unit in Tot Khadim. I served in the second Lebanon war and we had a, a Druze soldier that served with us. That was very much part of our unit and was a brother with us and you know, the Jews people are an integral part of Israeli society, even though they have this Arabic culture to them. They speak Arabic at home, and, um, but they're very, very loyal to Israel and very grateful because Israel, unlike a lot of the other places, has, you know, since the very beginning, given them equal rights and treated them with honor and with respect, just like we do to all citizens, no matter what their religion, uh, race, creed, you know, we, 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 it's, we're a a very much a democratic Western society when it comes uh, to that. Now, obviously there are difficulties like there are anywhere in being a minority. It's never easy, um, but, uh, but Israel does as much as possible to, uh, 
to help them um, succeed. So right now we have about a 20 minute drive and uh, I have uh, a couple of videos I would like to show. The first video is actually of Mount Hermon. It's the ski resort uh, that's at the top of the mountain. And uh, I'm sure you guys are gonna find it fascinating. We got some great footage. And when I was filming up there, it was a surprise visit from a group from Indonesia. But uh, if you're not into the video, don't go anywhere. It's a short video. And we're on our way to Telsaki to meet Major Sullivan, who's going to talk a little bit about the geopolitics of the area here in the Golan Heights. So um, if I can ask uh, Lee to go ahead and, oh, looks like she did it already. We are now at the famous Mount Hermon Ski Resort, which is situated almost at the peak of this beautiful mountain. It opened its doors in 1971 and has continued to expand. Today, there are over 25 miles of trails serviced by eight chairlifts. During its high season, it can accommodate over 12,000 skiers every day. However, the mountain is open all year round. And as you can see behind me, tourists are now taking the chairlift to the peak of the mountain where there's still remnants of snow from the winter months. From the top, you have these magnificent views of the entire mountain, the Golan Heights, the Hula Valley, as well as views into Syria. Recently, the ski resort opened up a snow park where you can go sledding, alpine sliding, as well as tubing. They have a full service lodge here with restaurants, a ski shop, ski rentals, as well as anything else you might need to enjoy a beautiful day on this mountain. An interesting fact about this mountain is that a six hour drive to our south will find you in Israel's most southern city, the city of Eilat, where even in the winter months, you could find yourself scuba diving in warm weather in the coral reef and amongst beautiful tropical fish. We're heading up the main chairlift now here at the ski resort, which is gonna bring us to just under 7,000 feet, which is really impressive considering that the peak of the mountain is 7,247 feet. It's probably gonna take us about 10 minutes until we reach the top. So I'm gonna sit back and enjoy these amazing views. What's so shocking is you just could look over here to my left-hand side and you literally see the border with Syria. Over the other mountain, heading to the west, is the border of Lebanon. We are literally right in the nest of the Hornet. We're almost at the end of the chairlift, which is about 1,500 feet higher than the base. And as you can see, there's a lot more snow up here. When traveling through Israel, you're bound to find some surprises, and today is no different. Here on the top of Mount Hermon, much to our surprise, we discovered a group from Indonesia who came here to Israel's highest peak in order to pray for rain and for safety for the state of Israel. a beautiful view here from the lodge at the top of Mount Hermon. You have an incredible view into Lebanon 
And you can see the most northern village in Israel, Matula, as well as the most northern kibbutz up on that hill over there of Misgavam. It's a little bit cloudy today, but on a clear day, you can actually see the Mediterranean Sea and the port city of Lebanon called Tyre. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed that video. You know, a lot of people, when they come to visit Israel, they'll say it at some, almost everybody at some point, like, I, I never imagined it would look this way. Because most people in their minds, when they think Israel, they think desert, they think camels, right? They think of, you know, the stories, you know, the biblical stories, you know, it's a wonderful place to connect to those biblical stories that they don't realize that we have these tall mountains, that we have beautiful, gorgeous waterfalls that are reminiscent of uh, Hawaii or some, you know, tropical rainforest. And we have the beautiful coastal plains and the, some of the most gorgeous beaches in the world. We really have a little bit of everything here. So just back to the Golan. First of all, I want you to take a little look out the window over here and you can just see some of the landscape. It doesn't change much here. It is uh, very rural, again, 50 miles long, 20 miles wide, and only roughly about 50,000 people who live here. So very, very rural, and they live in pockets of community. It's not really so spread out. We don't have urban sprawl really anywhere here in Israel. We build up rather than out. We try and conserve and reserve as much land as possible for nature and recreation. But I want to talk a little bit about the heyday of the Golan Heights. And the heyday of the Golan Heights, unfortunately, came after the destruction of the Second Temple. And if you guys joined, uh, joined us for the tour of Sfat, we talked a little bit about how the Romans, after the destruction of the temple, also forbid Jews from entering Jerusalem, the holy city of Jerusalem. And so the Sanhedrin, the royal courts of law, and the, and the, and the, the Talmudim HaChemim, the, the scholars, the rabbis, the spiritual leaders had to move from Jerusalem, and they made their headquarters uh, in a city on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, another holy city here in Israel. We have four holy cities, and that's the city of Tiberias. Now, if that was the city where the scholars lived and there was a large population, where was the industrial center? So the industrial center was up here in the Golan Heights. This is where they made their money. And here in the Golan, they grew grapes, just like we grow today. And they also grew... Um, they also grew olive oil. And some of the best olive oil really in the world comes from this region of the Golan Heights. And this time period was called the Talmudic period. It was roughly about 300 CE to about 700 CE. In fact, in 749 CE in the common era, there was a major earthquake and many of the communities here in the Golan Heights were destroyed and only a few of them were rebuilt. But during that heyday for roughly about 500 years, uh, the Golan Heights had a population of about 200,000. That's four times the amount of people that were living here during that Talmudic period, roughly from 300 to 700 CE. And they were all Jewish. They were scattered amongst about 40 different uh, villages here in the Golan Heights. Many of them have been discovered. And we found synagogues that were used during that time and Beit Midrashim, which is like a, a house of Torah study. And we found their olive presses. And we learned a lot about how the community lived at that time. And, and a lot of famous rabbis that are even mentioned in the Gemara and the Mishnah, what we call the Talmud, uh, lived up here in the Gola. And the largest city, both today, believe it or not, is roughly about 7,000 people who live there today. And during this Talmudic period was an area known as Katsrin. You know, a lot of people like to use this word settlement, and it almost has a negative connotation because they think of people, you know, stealing other people's lands. But really, these settlements are built on top of the ruins of, of our great, great, how many greats ago, right? These were the, the ancient Jewish homes, whether it was in Judea and Samaria. David, we're losing you. Golan Heights have modern day Katsrin, and within the city of modern day Katsrin, I'm so sorry. I said we're losing you. So could you? So, so you know what? Let's let's let. I, I, there's a this, this one little strip here doesn't have great internet. 
why don't you go ahead and watch the video on the Talmudic village in Katsurim? That's what I was leading up to. Okay, perfect. But we do want to go back to some of what you were saying about border because we have questions. 100%. After. Thank you. All right. The Talmudic Park has reconstructed several buildings in order to give us a better idea of what life was like 1500 years ago. We are now standing in a typical home from that time period and it's named after Rabbi Abun, who is a character spoken often in the Jewish scriptures. The room I'm standing in right now was the main room of the house. This is where people would eat. This is where the children would sleep. And this is also where the family would get together in the evening. How did they keep the room cool? It gets really hot here in the summer months. Well, you can notice that there is a lacking of windows around the side. The only place you can find windows is all the way up at the top. And the reason why is that heat rises. So the hot air would exit through the windows and the cool air could come in when the doors were open. Another reason for the windows to be high up was for modesty, so that neighbors were unable to look into the home where the people were living. Look at the hanging shelf you see behind me. This was to keep the food safe from both children as well as mice. Now, the ladder you see in front of me, that went up to the master bedroom where the parents would have slept. Unless, of course, there were guests visiting in which case they would give the master bedroom to the guests and they would sleep down here with the children following in the footsteps of our patriarch Abraham, who was known for his hospitality. Let's go and see the rest of this Talmudic home. You can see that we're now in the kitchen of this Talmudic home and you have all the utensils here to make a wonderful meal. In ancient times, people would go and pick their grain and bring it to their house where they would use this utensil in order to grind it, producing the flour which would be used to create the dough. Now, once you've created the dough and you've stoked your fires in the oven, you would take it and you would actually put the dough on the outside of the oven, not on the inside. And this is where it would bake. And in just a few moments, you have fresh bread. In addition to that, they had all the pots and pans needed to make a whole five course meal. Now behind me through this door over here, you have the storeroom where the man of the house would keep his tools to make his livelihood. Now, most of the tools found here are all agricultural tools and they're based on the actual ones that were found in this excavation. The real ones are in the Golan Archaeological Museum, which we're gonna visit later on. Let's continue as we tour the Talmudic village here in Katsuri. As you make your way through the park, you'll notice that it's extremely interactive. In fact, you can pick up some of these ancient tools that were used to construct the buildings here in the Talmudic Park. And just over here, we have this ancient crane that would be attached to a pulley system, making it easy to lift up these heavy stones. Let's go now and learn how they constructed the roof. Oak trees are very common here in the Golan, and it was from this tree that they would build their roofs with. You see, they would take the trunk of the tree, lie across the roof, and then across those trunks, they would pick branches from the same tree. Now, this was great for shade in the summertime, but in the wet winter months, they had to waterproof it as well. And they would do this by putting a nice layer of soil on top of those branches, wet it with some water, and then use a heavy stone roller like this one to roll over the wet soil. And that would compact down and make your roof waterproof. Let's continue to the synagogue here in ancient Katsurim. Since we're in the Talmudic park, we should learn a little bit from the Talmud. The Jewish scriptures tells us a story a young child hiking through a village, and he notices an old man planting carob trees. 
the young child looks at the old man and says, old man, don't you know, carob trees take decades before they produce fruits. You won't even be around by the time this tree is producing its fruits. And the old man looks at that young child and says, child, when I came into this world, there were carob trees, and I want to make sure there's carob trees when my great-grandchildren enter it. It shows us a powerful lesson that in this world, we are required to leave it as good, if not better, than when we arrived into it. The synagogue plays part into that ideology. You see, a synagogue in ancient times might take 75 years to construct. They need to raise the funds, cut the stones, and do the actual building. So the people who donated money to the synagogue in the early years won't even be around when it's finally constructed. Take a look at the door behind me, the entrance into the ancient synagogue. Look at the lintel, beautiful carved out pomegranates. Shows the wealth that existed here in ancient Katsurim. Where did the people make their money? How did they make their money? Well, let's go discover the industry of ancient Katsurim. Archaeologists have discovered over 40 Talmudic villages here in the Golan Heights and believe that the population exceeded over 200,000. Now, the industry that maintained such a population was predominantly olive oil production. And here at the Talmudic village in Katsurim, they found a huge industrial center where they produced this olive oil. And it's believed that they used the major trade routes in the area to export this olive oil to Damascus and as far south of what would be today Saudi Arabia. Now, the way they produce the olive oil is by collecting the olives and bringing it to the machine you see over here. From here, they would use an animal or human labor and they would spin this wheel around crushing the olives and this first press would have the best olive oil coming from it this would be the olive oil that most people would use to uh, consume on salads or cooking or whatever their needs might be now the second stage is they would take the remaining sludge and they would put it in a basket like this fill it in and bring it to the machine over here using weight and pulley system and they would crush the basket producing even more olive oil. Now that olive oil would be a little dingy in color and a little bit more stringent, and you might not want to eat it, although you could. So most likely this olive oil was used to illuminate their homes using oil lamps. The last stage over here would take the remaining little bit of sludge that they had there and using a vise, they would tighten it as tight as possible bringing the last few drops of olive oil out of the olives. Now this olive oil, you would not want to eat. It would taste awful. So what would they use it for? They would most likely use it in their hair or for their body or for healing ailments, basically for holistic purposes. Tourists here at the archeological park can pre-arrange a Talmudic era experience where they can make their own bread in ancient ways, cheeses, and even olive oil, just the way we've seen it being done. Let's now visit Olea Essence, where they are still producing olive oil here in the Golan Heights with modern technology. We're now here at Olea Essence, a modern day olive press here in the Golan Heights with its owner and founder, Avner Talmon. Avner, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for coming here. Let me ask you, has there been any innovation since olive oil production in ancient times until the present? Well, most of the innovation went to uh, learn and to develop ways to filter the olive oil, and that's filtering all the good stuff out of the olive oil. So we better be a little bit more innovative and go back to the old times. Speaking of innovation, I understand that the byproduct of the olive after the pressing is actually harmful to the environment. But you've come up with a solution for that. Yeah, the byproduct of the olive is loaded with antioxidants, which all of us know that is good for the health. However, it's a little bit too much, too concentrated. And we found ways to reuse it, not recycle, but reuse. We take the byproduct, we turn it into vinegar, and we turn it into cosmetic uh, ingredients, fully natural and loaded with antioxidants. And that's exactly what we got and what we need. You're really wow. into archeology, span but simply don't have the time to visit all the national parks 
and excavations here in the Golan Heights, then the Golan Archaeological Museum, located in the city of Katsrin, is the place for you. The relics that can be seen here date as far back as the Chalcolithic period, all the way through the Second Temple period, the Byzantine period, as well as the early and late Arab periods. All right, fantastic. How's everybody doing? I hope you're all doing great. I hope you enjoyed that a little bit. The Talmudic village, the heyday here in the Golan Heights. But I'm actually in a new heyday. You know, there's a famous uh, poet here in Israel by the name of Yehuda Amichai. He says, the day Messiah will come, the Mashiach will come, is the day that the tour guide like me, instead of saying, hey, you see that person over there? Yeah, that local? Look just above him. That's a ancient Roman arch from 2,000 years ago, but rather says, you see that ancient Roman arch over there? Underneath, there's a Jew who returned to the land of Israel and is living here today. That's what's taking place right now. I'm so proud to be here with Major Sullivan, um, who's one of the first responders here in the Golan Heights. He serves in the 188th Brigade, a tank division here in Israel, has served combat in Gaza multiple times, including recently uh, during the uh, recent uh, escalation, the conflict in Gaza. But he's here today to talk a little bit about the site we're at and also the geopolitics of this region. I know that we had some, um, some questions um, and, I, and I feel like the person to answer those questions is definitely Major Sullivan. So Cheryl, if you could just give me like an okay, just let me know if we go a little bit over time um, so that we could time ourselves properly. Okay. All right. Cool. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, unfortunately the the uh, mics aren't here aren't working. So I'm gonna give my AirPods over to uh, to Major Sullivan and I'm gonna take over on the camera duties and uh, and he's going to be our guide here for the next twenty minutes or so. Okay. So can everyone hear me? David, you just tell me. Yes, it's Cheryl, fantastic to see you. Thank okay, you for hi. joining us. So uh, first of all, uh, hi everyone, shalom everyone. Um, I'm not gonna talk about myself too much. I wanna talk about this place. Um, but before I talk about the place, just one word about myself. Um, this first of all is my second time within a week uh, meeting people from Atlanta, Georgia. I had uh, last Tuesday night, 40 teenagers on the, Atla on the Atlanta a Jewish student union delegation to Israel, NCSY here, with Rabbi Nadek. So we had an unbelievable time here. And if your uh, son or daughter are on that delegation, then you can uh, get the full story. And the second thing I'll say, this is my second time with the Atlanta Israel Coalition. Um, maybe some of you remember a year and uh, four months ago, just a week before COVID broke into our lives. Uh, last week of February, 2020, I was in Atlanta and we held a program about the Golan. Uh, it was at Chabad al Alcaraz, and we spoke about many things, which I'll try referring to today in less than 20 minutes, including what has changed. Because some people in that uh, incredible event asked questions. We tried predicting, which is something you never do in the Middle East. So we'll talk about what has changed in the last uh, year plus. Uh, one last thing, Atlanta. Uh, I'm saying hi to my grandmother, Jackie Hirsch, who is uh, watching me, I'm assuming. Uh, my parent, my mother's from Atlanta, Georgia. My grandparents are there. She was born and raised there. And I myself spent a year of my life in Atlanta, Georgia. So for me, uh, anytime someone says Atlanta, even in an afternoon on a fast day, David and Cheryl said, Atlanta is real, something to do with Atlanta. I said, I'm coming. I'm in. All right. With that said, where are we now? So we are at a place called Tel Saki. Uh, you were just with David, the pre recorded program, and Mount Hermon, the northern tip of the Golan, and as David mentioned before, the Golan is a huge region. So the border is roughly 70 miles long, and if we move down the border, which David just zoomed down to be here only 10 minutes late. Sorry, David, I had to say that. Uh, we're at Tel Saki, the southern tip of the mountain ridge, which we can some sort of see in front of us, which gives us basically uh, the border between Israel and Syria is set on this chain of mountains to give us strategic control of the Syrian side of the border. So now that we understand where we are, before I talk about what is happening here today, including it just in the past few days, uh, I wanna say something, I'll, I'll say something about this site. 
This site has the most amazing story in the history of the Israeli de defense forces, of the idea. And I meet here veterans from the 1967 war, the 1948 independence war, uh, the Yom Kippur war in 1973, the last war that took side in the Israeli side. And I always say the same. This site has the most amazing story. It's not the most amazing battle. It's not the most important battle. It has the most amazing story. When I talk about the battle of Tel Saki, I talk about three battles. The first battle is when just a handful of paratroopers on this hilltop, together with several tanks from my unit, the 188, which was protecting the border those days, are located here in this region, on this hilltop and on the valley just around here, right in front of Syria. Friends, we are right now, by the way, standing 4,000 feet away from the border. Everything you see in front of you there, the houses, the mosques, it's all Syria. And this small team of soldiers is facing a whole Syrian division, and they managed to hold them off for quite a few hours. And after a rough battle that took place in the first hours of the war, and the first night of the war, we're talking about the Yom Kippur War, October 6, 1973, the first battle ends on the morning of October 7. In the morning of October 7, the soldiers here have a lot of casualties. Several reinforcement attempts to reinforce them have failed. And they're out of ammo. And the Syrians are literally around this hill. It's a face-to-face -face battle. And that's the point where the commander of this hill, a young paratrooper named Menachem, makes a call to retreat. There's just one little problem, and that is that everything you see around you, not only looking north and east, but also looking west and south, is full of Syria. Meaning this hilltop is, an, is one little Israeli hill that's surrounded by Syrian troops. The Syrians took over the region. And when he makes the call to retreat, he has only one place to go to, and that would be a small bunker that's located on the top of the hill, and we're going to walk into it right now. Copy. So as the camera comes in, this is the bunker. And I don't know if it feels like a bunker. For any of you who have been in a bunker before, you understand this is not even a bomb shelter. Uh, this bunker was on the top of the hill, no protection. It wasn't underground or covered. This wall, of course, was closed. And there were two tunnels leading into this, into this little room. Two tunnels leading into this. There we go. Much better here with the wind. Okay, there we go. Perfect. Two tunnels were leading in here. And as you see, this small space, this is a very small space. There were three bunk beds in here, meaning this little room was designed for six soldiers. However, 25 soldiers, tankists, paratroopers, retreated into this little room. The first battle is the battle defending the border, which ends in the morning of October 7. The second battle is of 25 young soldiers who retreat into this room, no food, no water, nothing left to shoot and protect themselves. And now the Syrian conquer the hill and they want revenge for all of their friends that were lost. These soldiers gave the Syrians a hostel. Out of 25 soldiers that entered this little room, 24 come out alive. One guy dies in the first minutes, 24 soldiers with no way to protect themselves. Again, no food, no water, no ammo, survive in this little room while the Syrians are outside trying to kill them. They survived in here, listen carefully folks, for over 30 hours. How did that happen? We don't have time for that. And when you come to Israel next time, I invite you to join me here with David or anyone or, or on your own to come here and enjoy this story because it's an unbelievable story. And that is the most amazing story in the history of the IDF, as I said, but they survived. And that's the second battle. And I always tell people that this is not a battle. It's not a military story. When these soldiers walk through this tunnel, there was a tunnel here leading in here, the little hall leading into this room, they're not war heroes fighting for the country like they were outside. They're a bunch of 20-year-old teenagers who just want to survive and get home to their mamas. 
and they're so vulnerable and they're so human, we can feel them. We can feel their horror, their pain. And that's what makes this story so amazing. The third battle, however, might even be more interesting than the first two. Think about this, folks, that the soldiers in here for over 30 hours went through horrible moments. Their friends were killed trying to rescue them. Their friends died in their arms in the hours prior to retreating into this bunker. They many times were about to commit suicide. They took out their grenades. They unlocked their grenades ready to die, understanding it's over. And when they walk out of this bunker, when they walk out of this bunker, there's another battle. There's a battle to give back the life. It's what we call the battle over the soul. All of these young guys, I hope you understand, are big time PTSD. Each and every one of them went through their own trauma. Each and every one of them has, you know, competes with it every day in their life. It's, it's, it's something we can't imagine. And I always say that when they wake up every day, they wake up in this bunker. When they go to sleep, the last thing they see before they close their eyes are these walls and they get back to life. 30 years after the war, they decide to reunite. For 30 years, they did not meet to deal with their traumas. And after 30 years, they got back together. And ever since they became a model in Israel for how to deal with PTSD, their brother bond. And one of the things they decided to do is to commemorate their friends who were killed. So if we can come closer. This is the monument that was built here nine years ago by one of the veterans in honor of the friends. And it's a very unique monument. First of all, look at the young faces. It's very rare in Israel where you have monuments and there's over 170 monuments in the Golan, but none of them have pictures. Usually you have names. Here you can look at the eyes, at the young faces. One more thing that's special here is that there's no rank. You're looking at these young guys, you have no idea who's a corporal, who's a private and who's a major because everyone is equal in the mission of defending this country. And one last thing is you have no idea what unit they're from. You don't know who's a paratrooper, who's from the 188, who's from the other tank brigade that took part in the battle here. Again, because everyone is equal in the mission of defending this country. They were one when they were fighting to rescue their friends and to fight for this country. And they're one also here on the wall. So that's the story of this monument. And maybe the most impressive thing in this monument is the flag on the top of the mast there. Uh, one of the largest flags in Israel, actually. And this flag is always here 24 seven. I'm actually the guy responsible for replacing the flag when something happens to it. And I can tell you if one little piece rips up, then I get a call from the mayor of the Golan Regional Council, Yaakov, what's happening with the flag. And the flag is here for two crowds. One for the people on that side. When they wake up every morning, the people in Syria see that after everything they did to us, we're still here standing strong. The second though, even more importantly, it's for us. And so when we look at these young faces of the people who died so young, who gave their life for this country, after we salute them, and after we feel the pain of the price we have for having a free state, a free Jewish state, an independent Jewish state, then you always remember the price was paid for something. And that's the something. And that's why the soldiers insist that every day, even when winter and snow, it always has to be up. So people remember not only the price paid, but also what was it paid for. So that's the story of this hilltop, as short as we can make it. Three different battles, three inspiring stories. And again, when you come to Israel, I'm told you to come here. It's just unbelievable. And one last thing about this place, uh, last uh, October in Israel, we launched a series called Sha'at Neila in America. It's known as HBO Max's Valley of Tears. The story I just shared with you was the biggest inspiration for the series. And it was actually filmed here on site. So if any of you watch the series, you might recognize some of the scenes here. I can tell you some of the teenagers from Atlanta last Tuesday recognized the place, they watched the series. And if you haven't watched it so far, you better go and watch it. How do they survive? I got to tell you that uh, you got to come in and hear the story. You can't do it in two minutes. It's, it's just an unbelievable story. Uh, it's really unbelievable. I'll, share, I'll, I'll honor one guy 
And I'll say that there was one soldier who at some point walked out of the bunker, handed himself into the Syrians, he surrendered, and he told them everyone inside was dead. Now, the Syrians actually believed him and didn't kill him because he was a tankist from the 188. He was wearing a jumpsuit, which we, uh, us tankists, we wear them. And so the Syrians thought he was a pilot. And, you know, you don't kill a pilot. They kept him alive, and this guy saved his friends. That's just one of the stories of how he survived. There's many more, but we still have to talk about what's happening today. So with that said, um, we're going to walk over a little bit closer so we can actually see the border. As I said, we're 4,000 feet away. And uh, folks, I know David spoke about it before, but uh, I'll say, right, right, I watched it. <laughs> I watched everything, David. So I want to say the following. Uh, from 1973, the battle I just discussed, until 2011, this is Israel's quietest border. The Assad regime, Assad, we're not, we don't have peace with them. We're enemies. It's an enemy state, but the border is stable. The fence between us and Syria, you could, you could just hop over it, just like you can hop over this little cannon. You, you would just hop over it. The IDF units sitting here were a bunch of old reservists were sitting here, you know, with their shirts open and their hairy as well, chest sticking out. They were playing backgammon. I mean, the craziest thing that would happen here is that a border would cross the border. Right? That's, this border was quiet. March 2011, about uh, 20, 30 miles east from here, in this is what we call the Dara province. This is where actually the civil war began in the city of Dara, riots which very soon escalated and became a civil war. Now, it's very hard to explain the Syrian civil war in two hours, definitely not in two minutes. So I can just say it's not really a civil war. We're talking about a war between civilizations. We're talking about the return of the Cold War, the US and Russia. We're talking about the Western world against jihadists, Al-Qaeda and ISIS. We're talking about ISIS and Al-Qaeda fighting each other. We're talking about the Assad government fighting, and Assad is just a very small portion of the uh, Syrian population, just 12%. This is not a democracy, if you're wondering. And we're talking about Sunni Muslims against Shiite Muslims. With that said, again, we're not going to go into all these historical explanations. But you understand there's six different wars happening in this region as we speak. How did it affect Israel? When we talk about the numbers, we're talking about, friends, we are talking about March 2011, meaning we're just past a decade. We're 10 years and three months after the war began here. We're talking about out of 23 million people who were living in Syria, we're talking about 13 million refugees. That means more than 50% of the people lost their home. 6.5 million of these 13 million refugees have fled outside of Syria to Jordan, which is just past that hill that way, to Lebanon, to Turkey, to Europe, of course, creating the refugee crisis. We're talking about over 800,000 casualties from people who were bombed by chemical weapons to artillery shells, to people who died from starving, to people who died from diseases, from people who died from drowning in the refugee camps. And regarding the Israeli border, so for the first two years, we were sort of watching it from the side. We were saying, okay, whatever happens in Syria stays in Syria, not really our business. But somewhere inside, we were praying and saying, you know, Assad, the dictator, it's time for him to go. Now, remember, we called this the Arab Spring, right? Democracy was coming to the Middle East. And we were imagining, you know, these young guys in the streets, you know, they'll make the dream of Israelis eating hummus from Damascus come true. When we woke up in February 2013, 90% of the long border between Israel and Syria was controlled by opposition forces. When I say opposition forces, folks, that region right there was controlled by the local branch of Al-Qaeda. The village right here I'm pointing at, 4,000 feet away from me, was controlled by ISIS, the Islamic State, their local branch, on our border. And suddenly people in Israel and our security system are saying, wow, we miss Assad. You know, that guy wasn't, he was evil. He was stable. Suddenly I have a bunch of young radical jihadists. These guys love the people who knock down, you know, uh, the Twin Towers. These guys, you know, love chopping off heads for dinner. And they're our neighbors. So suddenly, first of all, you have a new fence that was built from 2011 to 2013 here. Um, probably the greatest fence Israel has today because it has 
the greatest field intelligence abilities the IDF has to offer. The border we're looking at right now is being monitored as we speak by radars and cameras. Um, very high sophisticated intelligence uh, um, facilities. And today, the forces that are here, we have artillery units, we have drones constantly in the sky. We have tanks, my, actually the 188s, the tank units protecting the border as we speak. We have here special forces. And suddenly this became Israel's most dynamic and unpredictable border. I'm taking you folks to one last spot, and then we'll talk about what happened in the last few days. July 2018, after five years of ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and other radical groups, finally the Syrian regime is able to take over. They couldn't do it on their own. They had to use Russia, and they had to use Iran, or Iran's proxy, Hezbollah from Lebanon. And what happened there, friends, it was, I think David described it before. There were five weeks here where I would stand with groups. By the way, this is exactly what I told the Atlanta group last week, but they, they didn't believe me. The first thing I told them when I got on their bus, I said, friends, if you hear an explosion, don't freak out. Everyone laughed. And a second later, this is July, 2018, we heard boom. And then I said, friends, we're getting off the bus. After the fourth time you see a house blowing up from artillery or from a plane from the side, you stop putting it on your story on Instagram. It's not interesting anymore because it's happening every second. Everyone laughed. After two minutes, the fourth house blew up here. We were standing here in a war movie. We were seeing the Russian planes in the sky bombing the heck out of the villages. We were seeing uh, anti-aircraft missiles by ISIS being shot to the sky. We were seeing refugees running to the border asking for help. And, you know, for me, it was very challenging. You think this is challenging on Zoom to, to feel the border. Think about talking with all these explosions behind you. But what happens is within five weeks, Assad is back at the border. But that's not good news. We said we were missing Assad, but now it's bad news because Iran stepped in. Friends, uh, in the last three years, we are in war with Iran. It's not a war you hear about on the daily news, but we're in war. I'm not talking about the war against the nuclear plan. I'm talking about this region. Iran is trying to create here a front line with Israel, which means they'll have missiles and rockets in all of these houses we're looking at, just like they have, by the way, in Lebanon, the southern Lebanon and in Gaza. And Iran was the state behind the last clash in Gaza, the guardian of the walls operation, and they were sitting down with popcorn, enjoying the scenes and learning. Because they're not using their abilities right now. They're waiting to see what the guys in Gaza do. How can they challenge the Iron Dome? And then they want to do it here and in Lebanon. When we in the IDF train, we don't train for Syria or Lebanon. We are talking about the Northern War. We understand Iran is building facilities here, which will create the border between Lebanon and Syria to be one front. Second thing they're using Syria for is to deliver uh, special abilities, let's call it that way. We are talking about the, their strategic missile project. You know, we're talking about Hezbollah holding over 130 thousand rockets that can cover the whole state of Israel. When David took part in the second Lebanon war in 2006, Hezbollah had roughly 20,000 rockets, maybe even less, 130,000 rockets that can cover the country. But the good news is that these are statistic weapons, meaning I shoot 100 and I hope one of them will hit Tel Aviv. The bad news is that Iran is using Syria to transfer different uh, missiles or different, uh, I'm being careful what I can say and what can't I say, different um, that can help Hezbollah take these missiles and make them preceded guided munition. And then all I need is one missile at the Knesset building, one missile at the main train station in Tel Aviv, one at the stock market, right? One at the government offices. I shut down the whole state of Israel. This is already a strategic threat to the state of Israel. And the last thing is that we're, we don't have a map behind us, but Iran has, you know, global aspirations. They want to take over the Middle East and other things. They say it out loud. Their new elected president says it out loud. And, you know, they already have Iran, Iraq, Lebanon, Gaza. If they can get Syria, if you can imagine the map of the Middle East, you understand Iran will have a land corridor from Tehran to the Mediterranean. The keystone is Syria. And that's why Iran is investing hundreds of millions of dollars in this region while their economy is collapsing, while they're one of the countries that suffered most from COVID. And now the big question is, okay, so what does Israel do with this? When I stood in Chabad of Alpharetta last February with the Atlanta Israel Coalition at the event, I told the audience that 2020 will be a watershed line. 
Now, we were talking in February 2020, and I said that because in January, the United States of America eliminated the commander of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, the Qasem Soleimani, and that was one hell of a strike, you know, that, that really shook the Iranian regime and the Iranian forces. And then COVID started hitting Iran, and we knew that at the end of the year, we have the elections in the U.S., and I'm not going into political issues. I'm not giving my opinion. But we all know that the uh, previous U.S. administration put very heavy pressure on Iran, the sanctions, right, maximum pressure policy. And Iran's strategy was to hold on as strong as, as much as they can until November. And if President Trump wins the elections, then they need to recalculate the way they're operating because they understand they cannot survive four more years. But if President Biden wins, then they understand his policy will be to bring, come back to the negotiation table. And they're great negotiators. So their policy was basically Israel will strike us. The U.S. will put the sanctions. We'll, you know, we'll hold on. We'll bite, you know, we'll bite our elbows. We'll, we'll hold on to it. And by November, something changes. And in the Iranian, something changed. And we see from November, the moment that uh, the U.S. administration, uh, the, the Trump administration lost, that Iran started gaining confidence again. And now they're demanding lots of things from the U.S. as part of the negotiation. Um, they're being much more aggressive in the region. And this for us is, uh, is an alarm. And if we're asking about what you guys asked me about the watershed, unfortunately, my answer is that Iran will continue investing their money instead of their people in terror. And we, as Israel, will have to continue standing and confronting these efforts because that's a strategic threat to our existence, uh, not just as a local here in the Golan, but to the state of Israel. And hopefully, we'll find on our side the U.S., uh, the United States of America. That's your place to bring out your voices, your congressmen, your sen senators, that the New Deal must deal with not just the nukes, which is crucial, but also with Iran's aspirations to take over this region, with Iran's effort funding Hamas and Hezbollah, which destabilize this region. Of course, the Houthis in Yemen is a different story, but that's also uh, Iran destabilizing this region. And of course, something against this missile project, which again is a strategic threat to this region, to Israel and to the moderate allies, the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, etc. So the way we confront, just to conclude, I'll say is that we have our diplomatic efforts with, with the United States, with uh, Russia, with our new Arab friend, part of the Abraham Accords. We just, I just a few months ago had a group from the United Arab Emirates at Bahrain, and we look at this border in joint as, you know, common interest. We have the same enemy. We're also talking about military operations uh, all around this region. Um, sometimes on a weekly basis, we hear explosions in our houses and Life continues here in the Golan, I must say. But we have struck in, uh, in Syria against Iranian targets. Maybe it was us, maybe it was someone else, over 1,200 times the last few years. And last but not least, I'll say that, the, and this I also said at Chabad al Tureda, that the greatest answer we have to the Iranian attempt here is to continue growing, to continue building, uh, you know, build uh, stronger communities, stronger agriculture, stronger tourism. Uh, which will make this, the economy in this region become better. We'll, then you can have better roads here. More people will come living here. Friends, there are only 50,000 people living in the Golan. We need to be at 100,000 in front of Iran, and that's our greatest mission. So when you hear about something blowing up in Syria, I can tell you I don't wake up at night. Uh, I'm scared of the war that's going to cross the road here. I'm focused on raising my daughters. I'm focused on uh, helping my community uh, thrive. That's what we're focused on, and the idea of is what has to deal here. Question, folks. We have time for questions? No. So I'll say the following. Friends, you can contact me on Facebook, Slingshot Israel, or on Instagram, Slingshot188. And I'd love to hear your questions, your perspective on this whole program. Also, David's side, I'll share with David. Uh, feel free to contact me. I'll answer any question you have. And Bezrat uh, Hashem, when COVID's over, please come here to the Golan. It's safe. It's beautiful. And, uh, of course, I'll be waiting here for you at El Sassi. That was amazing and informative. As always, we 
very much appreciate your insight here in the Golan Heights. Coming to the up here, I just want to wrap up overlooking the beautiful Golan Heights here. I know we went slightly uh, over time, and, and that's okay because the information was invaluable. Uh, again, I want to say thank you to the Atlanta Israel Coalition, to Cheryl and to Lee, and for all of you for tuning in. This has been the fifth segment of a five part series virtual, live virtual tours throughout Israel. We were in Tel Aviv and in Jerusalem and in Hebron and in Spot and the Path of the Patriarchs and all of this great content has been made possible through your generous donation. So please, please be as generous as you can. We want to continue this programming, but not only do we want to do it virtual with the borders of Israel opening up, we are also putting together a real live tour face to face. That's right, friends hopefully in the spring of 2022. We just want to gauge a little bit of interest from all of you. Let us know in an email and a comment on Facebook if you're interested in receiving some of that information so that you can join us as a community coming here to Israel and showing our support. After a year and a half of zero tours here in Israel, we are really, really looking forward to seeing you all here again. So uh, hopefully you have that interest and that ability to, and we'll send you out that information probably in the coming month. Um, it'll be all uh, solidified and, and, and we can send you out the itinerary and of course the cost as well. Uh, if you want to leave any type of gratuity for myself, this is the last opportunity to do it. I can tell you all, uh, not being able to die for the last year and a half, uh, Atlanta Israel Coalition, other organizations that have hired me to do these virtual tours and put food on our table. And I've appreciated all of your generous contributions, charity, um, a, a gratuity. And if you can give to the Atlanta Israel Coalition uh, for them to produce this great content or to leave for David Sussman, uh, either one would be greatly, greatly appreciated. Thank you so much to all of you. Cheryl, if we have any questions or if we have any other time, I, don't, I know you have a few words you want to share. Uh, I thank you so much, Cheryl, Lee. Show your face, Lee. Everybody needs to see all of the incredible work that you guys have been doing for absolutely free. You guys have donated your time because you're a lover of Zion like the rest of us, but you're really putting that love into action. And uh, we can't thank you enough for everything that you do for us here on the ground. Thank you, David. And thank you, Yaakov, um, for joining us. It's, uh, it's wonderful seeing him in Atlanta, and it's even better seeing him over there because you know, he spoke to us about the land and now y'all are showing it to us. So thank you. Um, we're gonna miss these tours. Hopefully we'll see you live sooner than later and y'all can join us. Again, we wanna thank our sponsors. Couldn't do it without support of the Jewish Federation of Greater Atlanta, Harut North America, World Harut, um, the Consulate General of Israel and the Evans Family Foundation of want to be able to uh, thank our promotional partners who shared this with you um, and spread the word and uh, our media partners. Again, David Sussman's information. And here is a, a link in case you want to view the previous tours that we did. They were absolutely fantastic. And uh, we are happy to share. To learn more about us, please go ahead and uh, go to any of these links. You can find information. Um, and uh, as David said, if you contribute and put David Sussman, um, we'll be sending additional tips his way. And um, thank you all for joining us. We really appreciate having you. Thanks, David. Thank you. Thank you so much to everybody. God bless. Hi, God David. Bless. Great job. Thank you, Lee.